research on any animal, I always go over the radiographs with the owner because in reality, the owner owns these files. And so if they can read those or at least have a basic understanding of, of what I'm talking about and being able to see it, I'm, I'm very visual myself. So I like to show people what I've taken. And I think that's really important for a relationship between a client and a veterinarian. Greetings, horse enthusiasts across America. I'm Andrew H. Turnbull, and this is IHA Live. Tonight, we have a very special event. We have Danielle, the doctor of veterinary medicine, and we're going to be talking about understanding equine radiographs so that you become a better consumer, and me too, because I'm a, I, have, I have horses, and when I go see my vet, Daniel's going to help us understand why it's better if we understand what we're seeing. Daniel has always had a strong interest in large animal medicine. She got her Bachelor of Science degree in animal science from the Dalhousie. It's Dalhousie. Yeah, that's perfect. It is Dalhousie Agricultural yeah. Campus. She went on to get her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from the Atlantic veterinary college in PEI, which is Prince Edward Island. She moved to Nova Scotia to practice large animal medicine after vet school and jumped at an opportunity to move back home to Prince Edward Island. She continues to enjoy her horsework as well as emergency medicine. She's got a particular interest in equine lameness. And so today I would like to welcome Dr. Danielle Thibault, from, from Prince Edward Island, Canada. Welcome! Woo! The crowd goes wild. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit more about your background. And, and uh, I know that Ada recommended you. How, did, how does that relationship, because it's wonderful to have you, we just wanted to know a little bit about you and, and how we got together. So um, I moved to uh, the Valley, Nova Scotia, after graduating from vet school to practice primarily equine medicine. Um, and I have an older horse with some chronic lameness issues. And I had this vision in my head on how to rehab her. And the only person that appreciated that vision as much as me was Ada. So I begged and begged and begged Ada to help me rehab my horse and with much convincing, um, she did. <laughs> and so um, we've shared lots of cases and stories and trials and tribulations together uh, since then, but it's been uh, a really good working relationship as well as a friendship, so. Well, it's wonderful. Hey, Ada, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot. You wanna come on for a minute? And say yes, something? hello everyone. Yeah, okay, you wanna come on? on picture too or just are we just going to see your name i'm in the dark it is nighttime here my family is sleeping and i'm in the car so i can have a quiet that's spot right it's me. it is it's after nine o'clock back there on at, at atlanta time yeah go ahead T tell us a little bit about your experience with danielle well danielle has been absolutely amazing to work with and thank you for the kind words danielle that was so sweet and wonderful when we connected um, she was wanting to find a trimming method that would improve Victoria's hoof angles of her P3. And I guess what we started doing is when COVID locked down and Danielle moved to PEI, she started trimming and I would review her trims with uh, pictures and she'd send me pictures and I would draw on the pictures what to do. So this has been our relationship and Danielle is always very good to answer any questions that I have about anything vet related to. She takes care of me just as much. Well, that's wonderful. And just before we get started, I wanna recognize that we've got people from, Rita is in the South Island of New Zealand. Rebecca's from Newfoundland here. Sue Town's from Washington. We got, Rigaud, as I said, Rigaud, Quebec, and Oregon, Texas, North Carolina. Absolutely wonderful to have you. And of course, I'm out here in the San Francisco Bay Area of California. So Danielle, without any further ado, let's, let's have you go ahead and take us through your slide set. And then I'll be watching for questions there in the chat. Okay, perfect. 
Um, I'm going to stop my video only because I talk with my hands. I think it's the French in me. Um, yeah, no so problem. it's really distracting, I find, when I'm talking. So I want my slides to be the center of my discussion tonight. Okay. Can you guys all? Wonderful. Okay. Can you guys all see that? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, perfect. So um, I'm Danielle Thibault and uh, I am a doctor of veterinary medicine and I'm going to talk about a little bit of understanding uh, with equine radiographs tonight. Uh, there's a lot to cover and I could probably talk for hours on this topic, uh, but I will try to keep it sort of the main points and, and keep in mind I'm not covering nearly everything that comes with horses because they're so problematic. I think if we look at them wrong, sometimes they are either lame or they colic. So um, such is the horse, but uh, we'll try and just cover a few basic topics tonight. Okay. And so um, what I'm going to talk about first is basically what uh, your veterinarian will come do when you have a lame horse um, for the purpose of radiographs. Uh, and we'll all start with a lameness exam. And so it's important um, as owners and veterinarians to know some basic anatomy, uh, and that helps us to localize lamenesses and to treat these. Um, and so for us, what we would do when we go to a lameness workup is we start by watching the horse move and seeing what uh, leg the, the horse is lame on. Uh, a lot of the times we use uh, the kind of phrase it's down on sound um, so if you have a front end lameness the head will bob up on the sore leg and down on the sound leg um, which is, is easy for front end uh, forelimb lamenesses but the, the hind limb lamenesses can be a little bit more difficult if it's really obvious the horse's head will go down on uh, the lame leg in the hind end to take the weight off of that leg um, but it takes you know a pretty good eye to catch some of these these not so obvious uh, lamenesses. And so when we watch the horse move, we decide um, to do some flexion tests after that. And so that's what you see in these pictures. You have people flexing the limbs and a lot of the time you start at the most distal part of the limb. So the farthest away and you try and keep the rest of the leg as relaxed as possible when you flex these areas, it helps to again, localize the area. And so what you're doing is essentially you're just exacerbating that lameness by doing a flexion test by holding that leg up for 45 seconds to a minute and then letting the horse trot off and uh, the horse should be more lame when you flex the area that's painful. So after we do our flexion tests, uh, we move on to nerve blocks and that helps us just localize that lameness even more. So we will use some lidocaine or bupivacaine to inject over the nerve in the area. And so we start at the distal end of the leg and work our way up. And so where we inject this uh, depends on where we block out that lameness. And so what we strive for is getting a horse to improve with their soundness when we inject that lidocaine so that they look sound after. And that um, allows us to localize the area of lameness when we block that out. Um, and so when we do that, then we move on to radiographs and that allows us to try not to waste too much money by radiographing all of these separate areas. We just try and radiograph the area that's affected uh, after we've localized. So that's kind of our, our basic lameness exam. And so why does my vet want so many views when we do radiographs? And for me, this is really important because it's, it's not about the money. It's just, we need to get a 3D image as best we can uh, when we're taking these radiographs because some things you can see in certain views and others you can't. And so by doing all of these different views, we really get a full thorough picture of what we're looking at. And so we can give you the best possible treatment and outcome for this by knowing the full story on what these Oh, pictures. doctor, I just yeah. love, I just love these two <laughs> examples where it looks like the prince is flipping everybody off. He's <laughs> yeah. giving three up and it looks like the, the lioness has the uh, baby in her mouth, but she's just carrying it. And this is, this is tremendous to help people understand why 
we have to have multiple views and I appreciate that. Yeah, it's it's really nice. I, as I said in my little interview, um, I'm very visual. So obviously I'm hoping that my visual uh, things here help everybody to understand. So I really mm -hmm. like these. I think they're quite funny. Yeah, I love it. So um, then we get into some of the anatomy and the terminology. And so we have to um, understand uh, basically mostly your distal limbs because um, when we're dealing with horses, probably 90% of our issues resonate in the hoof um, and typically lower limb areas. So that's gonna be the focus of my presentation tonight. Um, but I will show some pictures of some unique um, cases that uh, are not associated with the distal limb. But understanding uh, the bones that make up the distal limb and the tendons that support those, those bones and the weight of the horse and the ligaments as well. And so if you can kind of understand some of the major structures that are within the leg, then you can uh, have a better understanding of what your veterinarian is trying to talk to you about. And so when we have terminology, we have distal and proximal. So far away, is your distal proximal is closer to the body. Medial and lateral is just what it sounds like. So the medial aspect of the leg is uh, the middle part um, aiming more towards the center line of your horse and your lateral is the outside part. And we get to dorsal and palmar or plantar. And so that's um, dealing with the dorsal aspect of the leg. So the front part of the leg and the palmar aspect is the back part of the leg on the front end. And the plantar aspect is the back part of the leg on the hind end. And so mm. we have uh, bones and joints and attachments. Um, and so these can all be areas of concern when dealing with um, our lameness exams. Osteophytes, you might hear me talk about those. And so what those are is just a little bony growth um, around the area of the joint. And it's just a little basically arthritis, the beginning stages of arthritis, but those little um, picks that we see developing on the bone is what it looks like, uh, is called an osteophyte. And sclerosis is just some changing of the bone that you might see with certain um, bony remodeling. So these are some of the things you might hear me talk about. One of my favorite resources that really helped me through vet school is listed on here. And uh, it's actually a really neat interactive site and you can highlight the bone in a radiograph or on like a model of a leg and it will show you in a 3D image um, what exactly that bone is and, and how it, it relates to all the other bones. So it's, it's kind of a neat page for um, people hey. to check out. Wonderful. And so here we have um, just the basic structures of the distal limb. And so what we're going to um, focus on are the deep digital flexor tendon. And um, that, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but that's going to run along the back of the leg here. And it's going to attach on the bottom of, oh, my bad there, P3. Um, and so that's a very, very important structure. And we can see that structure uh, be affected in a lot of ways. And so you yeah, have I your- can see your mouse. So the mouse okay. is working, thank you. Perfect. Yep. Um, and then we also have P1, um, which is proximal phalanx, um, P2 and P3, which is our distal phalanx, which uh, is also known as the coffin bone. And um, it's, it's probably the most important bone in the horse's body. Um, and so one other bone that we have here that's very important uh, is the navicular bone. And so then on the front of the leg, we have our, um, uh, we have our extensor tendon that's running up the front. And then we also have our superficial digital flexor tendon that runs along here as well, which tends to be less affected. Uh, then your deep digital flexor, that's the problem child of all the tendons, um, as I personally know with my own horse. So um, this is just a basic outline of, of some of the common structures in the leg. The other one that is pretty important in the front leg is the carpus or the knee. Uh, and this is made up of quite a few little bones and joints. And um, it's it tends to not have as many issues 
as some of the other joints in the leg. I find it to be pretty good. When it does have issues, they can be quite serious because as you have all seen by being horse owners, it's a very high motion joint. And so it, it moves a lot. And so when we get arthritis it, in this area, it does tend to be quite serious. So that is something to keep in mind. So I got a quick question on that yeah. previous slide on that um, the carpus knee below that one. Are we looking at the front, the side? Because that, uh, that, that bone that you that has C dot A that you're pointing up to. I'm this one here. I, yeah, I'm, I don't understand that from the perspective of the leg. OK, so this um, is is a bit obliqued. It's mostly from the side, but you can see if it was completely from the side, you wouldn't be able to appreciate these other bones as well. So it's a little turned so you can appreciate all of the bones mm -hmm. um, of the carpus, but this accessory carpal is just on the back of the knee. Okay. Yeah. Got and it. It, you, it doesn't really stick out that much. Uh, you can feel it a little bit if you're really paying attention, but it it blends in very well with um, the rest of the leg. So it's not really a very noticeable one um, from like a, your perspective as a horse owner, it doesn't stick out very much, so. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so hey, I, this got is... quick, I got a quick question already. Yeah. Can I throw this in? Sue Town writes, what type of force is put onto the larger tendons, such as the DTFT, when there is fusion of P1 slash P2 pastern joint? Uh oh, Sue, are you a veterinary? Um, it is possible to relieve, oh, is it possible to relieve the extra stress put on this tendon when there's fusion on this joint as in high ring bone before the tendon develops min min oh, mineralization? Thank you. And um, I don't know if that's beyond our group, but if you want to take a shot at it, you're welcome. So if you have ring bone, um, you, as long as it's fused in a very good angle, so there's no poor conformation or poor hoof angles, um, then if your angles are pretty good, you shouldn't have any increased strain on your deep digital flexor tendon, which is your DDFT, which is what she's talking about. Uh, and that's that tendon that runs down the back of the leg. And so as it's, you're obviously going to have inhibited movement because you don't have the range of motion from that ring bone because that joint is fused, but it's, it shouldn't, unless there's mineralization, which is her question, um, which that in itself can impede your deep digital flexor tendon. Um, but the ring bone itself, as long as it's not affecting the deep digital flexor tendon, it shouldn't affect it uh, that much. There are things that you can do to um, relieve that strain on that flexor tendon if you've got any. And the number one thing that I want people to kind of take away from this talk as well that I don't cover a lot of, but it should always be in the back of everyone's mind is um, fixing feet angles and ensuring that you have adequate um, heel that's supportive of the hoof and not under run. Um, and so when you fix your feet and you fix those angles uh, and you have a really good angle of, of P3, uh, P2, P1, so a good hoof pastern axis, uh, then you should have uh, optimal relief to your deep digital flexor tendon. I'm sorry, that's probably a complicated answer, but- Actually, um, I actually kept up with it, but I'm literally- taking notes like I was in university so but uh no I appreciate it and uh but what I think what it does for me because we do have a, a one of our horses with ring bone is to it just makes me ask want to ask more questions but um anyway thank you for taking that shot and that was great yeah um so the the next uh joint that's very common to horse owners is the tarsus or the hawk uh, and as you can see, it's very complicated. There's a lot of smaller bones in here, uh, which can be problematic in the horse because they're large animals uh, and they have a lot of weight on their, their hawks. Um, and so these can be tricky to interpret, uh, interpret with radiographs because the joint itself, these joints that you have in here, 
Um, obviously this one here, this top one is more high motion. And, and these, this one here and this one here are not going to have the motion. So all your motion in your hawk comes from here and here, um, which is good because these joints here, these smaller bones, what happens with the weight of the horse over time, and this happens in every horse, is that these bones fuse together. So um, you're going to have horses through every stage of their life that when you take radiographs, they're probably going to have some changes to the, the hawk. Um, and so interpreting that can be a little tricky because a lot of the time these changes are incidental findings because it's going to happen in literally every horse. So uh, some horses it can cause lameness issues and we, we treat that, but other horses, they get along just fine while the hawk fuses. And typically most of these horses, once those joints are, are done fusing, never have a knock on wood because they're horses never have issues um so the the hawk is definitely an interesting uh part of the horse's anatomy and uh definitely you're going to see changes there um with every horse so it's kind of neat that way um but there's a lot of issues that can arise from the hawk that isn't just um arthritis and and uh that those joint spaces collapsing and changing and fusing. Uh, some of the more common hawk issues uh, are OCD lesions and that's osteochondrosis desiccans. And I will talk about that a little bit more later, but uh, this is your basic intro to the hawk. Okay, before you move on. Yep. Got a couple of questions. One sure. question um, that Susan asked is when they inject a hawk, where do they actually put the needle? And that's one question. The second question from Emily is, can you explain what a veterinarian is looking for in a young, or when a young horse, a, a, a horse owner sends a young horse for knee x-rays to check for the proper development before starting under saddle? So there's two parts. One's injecting the hawk, where do they do that? Second one is, these knee x-rays for the babies, for the youngsters. Okay, so I'll start with the injections. And so the tarso metatarsal joint, which is uh, tarso metatarsal, so that's this joint here, uh, is um, pretty good at communicating with the joint space above it. In about 40% of horses, you'll get communication. So sometimes if you inject one, uh, you will get communication with your uh, product to the other joint, but sometimes you do have to go into both uh, spaces. And it really depends to what joint spaces you can get into. So that's why your radiographs are really important. Because if you already have collapse of those joint spaces and they're fusing, you're going to have a harder time getting your needle in. So really, you're going to take advantage of whatever joint space you can get into. But uh, typically, these ones are your most common. And so um, you can again, inject into different areas and, and get communication with the other spots. So it's kind of a tricky game sometimes of, of where you can get your needle in. Um, and as for the carpal x-rays, um, what we're doing is, let me see if I can go back. Um, we're checking for growth plate closure. And so what you wanna see is um, the, bo the bones coming together and becoming one. Uh, at the growth plate. And so that should look similar to this. Um, and every horse is going to be different, which is why it, if you are getting these radiographs done before you start riding, then that's, that's great. I think that's a wonderful idea. You're setting that youngster up for success uh, and ensuring that your growth plates are properly closed um, before you start any hard work. So I think that's an awesome um, question and point. Oh, that's great. Thank you on both of those. Um, really quick, um, we are a, um, a nonprofit 501c3, and we don't have commercials, but we do have a little pledge break that's available in the chat. If you're enjoying this live event, please consider buying us a cup of coffee by pledging to the IHA Live. And if you, um, Emily says, thank you very much for the answer, uh, Danielle, but I just had to take a little pledge break for our um, 
because this is this is public broadcasting. <laughs> <laughs> and back to you. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so again, this is just uh, a little uh, diagram of that tarsus, and this is looking at it from straight on, so from front to back. And um, this would be that bony protrusion you see at the back of the hawk. And so basically uh, what this is saying is that you have all of these different joint spaces. And so it's essentially four joints in one and with a mix of high motion and low motion areas. So the low motion areas are the areas that you prefer to see arthritis infusing in. The high motion areas don't fuse as well because the horse needs those joints to really um, have proper movement. So you can see a lot of those lameness issues um, and, and mechanical lamenesses with those horses that have issues with those high motion joints. Um, okay, so we will move on to um, just some radiographs of the forelimb. And um, this is my own horse. Don't judge, this was before we started really picking away at her feet but I want to show uh, your P1 bone here, P2 and P3. And so she has a fairly decent uh, hoof pastern axis. And so what that means is a, a very good straight line from uh, the center of P3 up to P2 and up to P1. And as you can see, the spaces between her joints are equal. Um, on, on each side and they look good. This is uh, a foramen in the foot. This P3 looks pretty good. And uh, our sole depth is not too bad. The toe is a little long and obviously the heels need to be brought back. But overall, this radiograph is um, pretty aesthetically um, pleasing for me to look at. Um, and I'm not seeing um, too much evidence of any arthritis. Uh, and then this is your navicular bone. And so that's uh, a tricky little area that can take some um, extra radiographs to really assess. And so this is uh, the forelimb, my horse's left fore, uh, fore, forelimb, and uh, it looks pretty good. So I don't know if there's any questions about the normal radiographs before I move on. Yeah, I got a quick question on the, um, there seems to be a circle in, I think, yes. do you call it P1? Is it the same as the um, coffin bone? This is P3 and that's the same as coffin bone. Okay, oh, P3, thank you. Yeah. So there's a circle there and I know those circles tend to, you know, kind of get my get my attention. What are, What is that little circle kind of there in the middle? Uh, it's just a foramen. So it's an area where vessels and things would uh, move through and that's a normal finding. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and so this is a friend of mine. This is her young horse. Um, and so this has a negative palmar aspect. And again, so we have that terminology. This is the dorsal aspect of the limb. And this is the palmar aspect. And it's palmar because it's a front leg. It would be plantar if it was a hind leg. Um, and so we call this a negative palmar angle because it's the back of, of the P3. And um, what we're seeing here is this P3 starts to dip backwards. And that really, really throws that hoof pastern axis out of alignment. And so really, we would really want to see um, getting, getting rid of this shoe. Uh, so a lot of the time, farriers and veterinarians will automatically go to um, shoes. And uh, <laughs> this is a tricky topic because I think there's a time and a place for shoes. Um, do I necessarily think this is the time and the place for it? Um, I prefer to uh, consider perhaps a bit more natural approach. I want to see people fix these hoof angles before they do anything. If you fix the foot and the angles and you still have a lameness, then you can consider shoes potentially at that point if that's really the best option for that horse. Uh, however, I, I think that the, the trimming is the number one fix here. And so what I would suggest as a veterinarian is to um, get rid of some of this toe 
and, and really develop those heels and, and bring them back. And so as we shorten the toe and bring the heel back, we're going to uh, change the angles of this hoof and change the angle of P3 and then have a better alignment. And so you can just imagine when that deep digital flexor tendon attaches here and you have that negative palmar angle, the strain that it's putting on that tendon as it runs along the back of this foot is immense. Oh, I keep doing that. I keep clicking, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> so we, we do have a question that came in about, um, what do you mean that the heel needs to be brought back? And I actually share that. And then my second question is, um, help me understand the negative Palmer angle because I, I do no math, but I can't tell what you mean by the Palmer angle. So um, let's go back to this radiograph. And you see here how if I were to put a line from here and here, and then a line from here to here, my angles would be positive. And so the moment this part of P3 goes further down like this one does and becomes flat along the bottom of the foot, your angle of that P3 becomes negative. And so you want to have a positive angle uh, on, on your P3. So you wanna change the degree of rotation. You wanna rotate that so that's a positive angle because this is dipping below your um, X axis. And so that's becoming a negative angle there um, when, you're, when you're kind of measuring from here. And um, what was the other part to that question? The other question was around bringing, needing the oh. heel to be brought back. Yeah, so a lot of the time these cases, uh, the problem is, is that the heel is under run. And so by bringing the heel back under, you're getting more support for the back of the foot. And that's what they're trying to do with this shoe is they're trying to support the back of the foot because there's no the sole depth isn't here. So you can see that the depth of sole isn't great because the heels are under run and you can almost visualize lines coming down um, from that hoof wall. And you'd be able to see it if you had a picture of the hoof wall itself, uh, but the heels are, are under run and you wanna bring those back and just improve the angles of the foot. And so when you have more heel support, you're gonna lift the back of the foot up, which changes your angle of P3 and becomes a positive angle. So this, when it falls below that x-axis, so if there was an imaginary line here, you would change that and make it angled this way. So Adam pointed out the angle of the two tubules, tubules in the yes. hoof, all right, it, it, in the hoof need to match the toe, pastern, and heel. Yeah, and right now- and You can say tubules... that sentence back because I, I don't know if I'm saying tubal, <laughs> tubules. It's the tubules in the hoof. And oh, so tubule. she's exactly right. So those tubules of the hoof wall will are matching P3 right now and running forward. And you need them to change and become more upright as well as bring P3 in and bring that right back. You basically want a straighter line from here, here to the tip of the, the toe, the tip of P3. And you don't have that here. You have that broken axis. So if you drew a line, it would Thank go you. straight. And then if you drew another line, it would cross like that. Whereas if you drew yeah, a line really through this that. one, you have a much yeah. better, better line. Got it. Now this is not this is not the same horse, is it? No, these are two different horses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because obviously that's a we're talking about a shoe. And then in this case, you have a nailed on shoe, and presumably you had a an issue, and so you may be telling the owner, um, hey, it's time to, to meet a trimmer and, and go that route. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, and so unfortunately in this case, this client uh, was swayed a little um, in believing that shoes were the option to fix this. And um, really it should have been in the trimming. The trimmer was not doing this horse any favors. Um, and so my recommendations were to take the shoes off and, and trim in a dif different way, change the trim and fix the foot. But it's really hard to convince some clients to ditch the shoes when so many people who are into performance horses believe in them. And it's, it, it needs, that mindset really needs to change. I appreciate that. I, I put shoes on my horse when I first bought them because that's what you do. 
he was my first course. And it actually was my wife that convinced me. So I, I've been through the process myself. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's tough. This is a painful um, radiograph to look at because I can just imagine the, the strain on that tendon in this picture. And, and so it's, it's going to complicate a lot of things. Um, this horse will present with caudal heel pain. So people might think it's navicular as opposed to um, really just it being the, the strain of that deep digital flexor tendon running back over here um, down the back of the leg. So it's, it's unfortunate. Wow. I really, man, this is the best I've ever seen of somebody showing us pictures and pointed out. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, Thank you. Good. I'm glad. So um, some other common things in the foot. Uh, this is a really neat view and one of my favorite views to take of the foot. And so we're looking down uh, over top of the foot. And so this is the hoof around here. This is your coffin bone here. And you can see all these little dark um, channels and they're vascular channels. So for blood flow, which is really kind of cool. Uh, then you have your um, P2, which is this bone here. And then you have P1, which is up here and going out of view. And then you have your navicular bone. So that little bone that sits at the back of the foot. And so this is it here. And this one has a really neat issue in that it has a subchondral bone cyst. And so that, that kind of dark circle that you can see in that navicular bone is a cyst. And uh, these cases can be uh, interesting. They can um, certainly present as an incidental finding. So, uh, you know, you may not have a lame horse, but you take radiographs and you find this. Uh, other horses will be quite lame and it really just depends on where that um, cyst is, how big it is, um, and, uh, you know, what structures it could be affecting as well. And so um, what we find here is that cyst, here it is another view of this. And so this is your navicular bone here. And what you want are um, a, a brighter white outline, which is what we have, and then a darker inside with these little vascular channels. Uh, this one has, those, so these little dark little lollipops that we have in here are the vascular channels. And so this one has quite a few in there. So I would say that's increased. And then you have this area that's dark along that uh, border of that navicular bone. And so this is your flexor aspect. And so this area of your navicular bone is actually where your deep digital flexor tendon is going to run along. And so if you have that cyst that's affecting that edge of the navicular bone, um, you're, you're probably going to have a lame horse because now it's affecting the integrity of this bone um, as well as the deep digital flexor tendon that's going to run along it. And so this is that same horse. It's a little harder to appreciate on this view, but that's the navicular bone there. And uh, it just looks a little bigger, some slightly elongated in this picture compared to some of the other navicular bones that we'll see. And I don't expect you guys to um, take notice of that at, uh, for the purpose of this um, presentation, but it to me is, is big and it's got some um, challenges associated with it that have it's changed its shape a little bit. So um, that's a cystic structure in that navicular bone um, that you can have. And uh, so did yep. Skyline present just really quickly, did, did, yeah. did Skyline is the horse? Uh, no, that's the view. Oh, the view. Okay. But did the horse present as lame? Yes, this horse did. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And so these ones are tough because um, you can attempt to treat these, but you because it's a cystic structure in that bone, you're not really going to fix it. Uh, so for these horses, some of the treatments that I'd recommend are um, proper trimming. So keeping those angles good so that you don't have too much strain on that deep digital flexor tendon as it goes over the navicular. Uh, and then I tell people to consider pain medications. So common pain medications for horses with mild um, issues are Prevacox or Equiox, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. 
Of course, mm -hmm. you can always give butte. That's pretty common, but there are some concerns with long-term butte administration just because it can be a little hard on their stomach and sometimes their kidneys. Um, but I've had horses that that's the only um, strong medication that keeps them pasture sound. And so you kind of um, weigh the risks and the benefits in those cases. Um, some of these horses will benefit from the bursa, which is um, just the pocket of fluid that surrounds the joint space, you can do injections into those areas. And so the navicular bursa um, can get injected with different substances, so steroids or hyaluronic acid, different things like that, um, to help protect that joint space and to lubricate it. And so uh, you can do injections in there. Or you can consider things like osphos, which is a really common treatment for navicular cases. Um, so horses that have caudal heel pain or navicular syndrome, which would be this horse in this case would have that um, because of this, this finding. Um, and so osphos is a bisphosphonate. And so what it does is it can slow down some of that bony remodeling that you're seeing happen in that navicular bone. Um, and so it'll stop or not stop, but dramatically slow down the changes that are happening to the bone itself. Um, but there are you know, risks and concerns with horses um, getting osphos injections as well. Um, if you have any fractures, it can impede healing with those cases because again, it stops the bony remodeling. So if you have a fracture, you have to be really careful um, to not give that or to have a horse that's been off of osphos for quite some time so that the fracture heals. Interesting. Hey, I, gotta, I do have a couple of questions. Um, almost, is it fair to say that most hoof issues are in the front feet as opposed to the hind? Yes, that's 100% true. And the reason for that is because horses carry probably 60% uh, of their weight up front. They're very top heavy uh, because of that big, big, <laughs> big empty noggin that most of them seem to have, or maybe just mine. I don't know. Um, but the, the big head, the big neck, those big shoulders, and then that, that little back and hind end is, is nothing compared to the front end. Yeah. So they carry, it's, it's mostly because of carrying the weight. Mm -hmm. And we did, we, we talked at a recent IHA live about saddle fit and how, um, where the person is placed can exacerbate or make it worse. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, the another question was, what is a cyst? So a cyst is just um, an area where you have um, either fluid or um, loss of bone density, and it's typically genetic in nature. So or I shouldn't say genetic, it should be um, congenital. So it, they're typically born with these. Um, and it's, it's just a defect in the bone. Uh, a lot of the times the cartilage, when that joint is forming, uh, doesn't form properly. And so you can just get, um, it's just an area where the bone has not, not grown the way it should have, which is unfortunate because it can cause a lot of issues. Got it. Next question was, what is a bursectomy? A, a bursa. So a bursa is just um, the, the fluid filled, joint fluid filled sac that surrounds um, the navicular bursa in particular is the, the bursa that surrounds the navicular bone. And so it just provides some um, joint fluid lubrication and cushioning. Got it. it it's interesting as you went through the number of, um, of uh, uh, chemical approaches, if you will, um, I have two horses on Prepacox. Um, certainly, if you use Butte, we have Osphos we've been through. And um, we have had injection, and one of our horses does have injections. So um, I know my family's had, uh, it's mostly Renee with her horses. Um, I've heard of all of those. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I do have two horses uh, pretty much permanently on, uh, on the Prepacox. And, I don't know, I didn't want to take you off of your subject, but it's interesting that the horse takes about one fourth of what the dog takes of that same medication. Yeah. And it's, it's essentially like us taking um, Motrin or Advil, right? Yep. Yep. It's the exact same thing. And uh, yeah, the doses for horses are 
<laughs> astounding when you compare them to the doses for dogs. Yeah, it's one quarter of a dog pill is yeah. what I give to these like 1300 pound beasts. Got it. Yeah, anyway. yeah, it's great. Yeah, which I, I'm actually thankful for. And uh, is there any, is there any long term problem with being on an NSAID? Uh, yeah, the, over the long term? There certainly is. It's the same as people. Um, they can certainly have some effects on organ function, um, kidneys in particular, if they're at all dehydrated. So uh, that's a concern. And then the biggest concern in horses would be gastric ulcers. And so everyone's probably familiar with stomach ulcers. Um, and so the concern is really when we have horses that aren't eating and are getting non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or NSAIDs. Uh, and so the reason being is that uh, if they continue to eat, uh, it's a lot safer and you're less likely to encounter these issues because they're producing um, saliva and bicarb and they're buffering um, these, this acid production. And the way these NSAID works, these NSAIDs work is that they target certain um, cells in the stomach that to get to make a long story short affect prostaglandins and create stomach ulcers so you know if you have a horse that's eating well and has hay in front of them all the time you're less likely to be concerned about the long-term effects of these medications oh i love it thank you so much my horses are on pasture so that's great Perfect. um we had somebody ask if equiox is more comparable to celebrex in people Oh, I'm not sure about that product, Celebrex in people, um, but it's, it, I, I always just compare it to um, like an, an Advil um, type medication. Yeah, because it isn't Equox, is, uh, is that a generic of the uh, Prevacox? <laughs> Actually, Equiox is just a terrible, terrible way for the drug companies to get more money out of horse people um, because it's the exact same um, pill as the Prevacox. It's still beef flavored and everything, even though it's marketed to horses, um, which is very strange. But if you smell it, it's, it, and it smells strange, it's because it's beef flavored. Um, and it's, it, it's a smaller version. Equiox is 57 milligrams comparable to the 227s that you give your horses and you quarter those. Uh, and yeah, it's, uh, Sometimes in some states, they won't allow you to prescribe Prevacox because it's labeled for dogs, uh, even though, again, they're the exact same drug. So, um, yeah, well, the, the hint there, uh, and I can't speak to what's going on in the various states um, or, or provinces where people are, but um, I've been able to find a veterinarian willing to supply me the, the dog pills and I just simply break them into fours. And that's working. I will not disclose the name of that vet because <laughs> I don't know what the laws are in California, but it's def it, it saves us a lot of money um, because literally I've, I've got half of one of those dog pills being consumed every day. That makes it a quarter of into two horses. And it's really helpful when, uh, when I can use something that's less expensive. So thank you for explaining that. Yeah, I also use the Prevacox 227s, but I won't uh, tell you my sources either, so. I love it. I love <laughs> it. Um, it says, um, is Equiox have a better safety margin than other NSAIDs as far as gastric ulcers? Yes, it does. It's um, less selective for some of those, we call them COX-2, um, uh, COX-2 enzymes uh, from, it's, it's a, again, a long explanation to explain those things, but yes, in, in short form, it's much safer in the long term than using something like bute or banamine, uh, which is why it's preferable to, to be given every day compared to those other, other drugs. Yeah, and then the last part, in my case, both of our palominos that are on it are absolutely um, chug wagon lovers, they eat like crazy. So that helps, that makes me feel better. Anyway, um, let's see, let's keep, let's, let's thank you so much. And those were great questions. Thank you everybody for bringing those in. Yeah, those are awesome questions. Um, so 
basically this was the same horse um, that I just showed you with the bone cyst. And so the reason your vet may want to do both front legs in this case is to assess that other limb for um, additional um, issues that might be going on. So this one doesn't have a bone cyst in the navicular, um, but it does have some changes which are seen here. So this bottom part of the navicular bone just looks really rough uh, on the bottom there, a little bit jagged. Oh, I keep clicking. Um, and so this is a much better representation of the, what we call corticomedullary distinction. And so the cortex and the medulla. And so you can see that distinction, that white line that surrounds the navicular bone versus this darkened area in the middle. And so this is, this is a much healthier navicular bone. And you can see again, those little lollipops, which are the vascular channels in there. And it's not too bad, but the only downfall is, is when we look at a close-up view, it's still rough on the bottom of this navicular bone. So, um, you know, not the same changes as the other leg, but still uh, something that I would say to this owner to keep an eye on. So as you fix that first leg and maybe do some joint injections or um, block it out to see if that resolves the lameness with your nerve block, you may find that this horse then becomes lame on this leg because of those changes. But again, with horses, and Andrew, I said this to you in our little pre um, talk that we had, uh, horses don't read the textbook. So uh, they're not going to follow <laughs> the rules, <laughs> um, which I'm sure many of you know. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you may have these changes on this leg and this horse is sound. So just because you have changes, they may not always correlate to a lameness. So that's why it's really important to evaluate that whole horse and do that full lameness workup. Because if you're not gonna do the nerve blocks, you're not gonna know if that horse is lame on this leg when you block out that more lame leg. So you block out that left forelimb and then you notice that your horse is also lame on the right. That's really common, especially in navicular horses because navicular typically affects both front feet. Maybe not always to the same degree, but usually the changes are, are there in both front feet and you get um, that you know choppy front end lameness when you have navicular horses. So blocking out both front legs is really important. And that's why your vet wants to be thorough with these lameness exams and these radiographs. So, you know, doing both front legs is so important to get the whole picture. And that's why we do all of these views as well to see those changes. Wonderful. I just want to check in. We're at an hour and we have another 30 minutes scheduled. So just, mm -hmm. just want to check in. Yes, I'm, <laughs> I have a lot more to go through, but uh, I'll try and you know, not take too much of everyone's time. Well, though, this is great information okay, though. So, perfect. Yeah, yeah, we're happy with what you're doing. Okay, yeah. so this one is a really cool radiograph that I found and it never, I have never seen it in real life um, myself. So this was a horse that presented um, and I, I, I don't have the full history because again, it's not my case, but it's a bipartite navicular bone. And so certain bones in horses um, typically have one center of ossification. So one center where uh, the bone grows from. And sometimes, because horses are weird, which we all know, that's why we love them. Uh, they can have these two centers of ossification. And so one of those places that we can see this sometimes is the navicular bone. And again, sometimes this can be an incidental finding. A lot of the time, these horses are lame or become lame over time because that's you know a lot of strain and pressure on those two pieces of bone. Uh, but this is something that happens, again, a congenital issue. So it's born with it and that's how it developed. And so it's not a fracture or anything like that. Um, so it's just a really cool, strange thing that, um, you know, because horses, so. Um, so this is a case example, and I'll have a couple of these. Um, and so this is a young horse that um, presented to me for an acute lameness. And this was 
Um, this was his first episode. I didn't see him at this time. Uh, he had a um, bilateral, so both front legs, forelimb lameness, and he was sensitive on the ground um, and, and it's kind of standing. Uh, they can stand stretched out sometimes. Um, and he was just not himself. And so they took some radiographs and uh, he had um, before on the physical exam, he had increased digital pulses. So when you feel the pulse going down to the foot, uh, these were increased. And oftentimes you can say in these cases that they're bounding because we do get pulses that bound um, in laminitis cases because of the, the bl increased blood flow and, and everything that's happening, the inflammation that's happening in the foot. And so uh, he also had feet that were very warm to the touch. So he, he had laminitis. And so what we tend to do in these cases is place um, a, a nail, a hoof nail on the hoof wall. And uh, in this case, you can see his hoof wall P3. And you can see um, some, I don't know if you can appreciate the difference in densities. So this part of the hoof is quite light. And then between that hoof wall and P3, you have the lamina. So that, that jelly-like structure that holds P3 into place. And so in this case, it's a little bit dark uh, and we can see it widens here at the bottom, that darkness. So it's pretty even here, 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 here. And then here it gets wider. So we know that we have some rotation of P3. And it's even more evident in actually the front right. Um, you can see that it's wider here compared to here. And so that means we have rotation of P3 uh, from an acute laminitic episode. Acute meaning it happens suddenly. So this is not a chronic case. Um, and so this um, is after his second bout of acute laminitis. Uh, and so we can take some measurements of the angle of P3. We can also assess the depth of the sole. Um, and uh, we can see here that this is even wider now, this dark part. So from here, it's again, narrow, 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 and it just gets wider as it goes down. So in this case, he actually had even more rotation in his feet from the second episode of laminitis uh, compared to his first. And again, you can appreciate it here. So that dark area is pretty narrow, 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 and then wide at the toe. And so that what happens in um, these cases of laminitis is that lamina, I, I call it like a, a almost similar to jello. So it, it should absorb shock. It should, if you put like a, you know, those freaky jello salads that old ladies make for potlucks and they have all like the fruits and stuff in it. So the fruit in your jello is basically P3. But if you heated up that jello and boiled it down, the fruit is going to sink to the bottom. And so that's the same as P3 when you have laminitis. The inflammation of that lamina just destroys those bonds that happen between um, your P3 and your hoof wall. And the reason we get rotation of P3 is because you have the deep digital flexor tendon attached to the bottom of P3. And so it's going to pull, pull, pull on P3. And the only thing that's um, against that pull of the deep digital flexor tendon is your lamina. And so when your lamina is inflamed, the pull of your deep digital flexor tendon is so much more. And so that's why that P3 rotates the way it does. And also the weight of the horse in severe cases can cause sinking of P3 because your horse is heavy. And when that lamina is destroyed, your, your weight of your horse pushes the bones down through the foot. And so we've had horses, and I'm sure Ada has seen them too, or, or been very close to some of these cases that have, they lose all of their sole depth and the, the P3 bone can actually penetrate the sole. And in, in those cases, it's catastrophic. Uh, oh my were, gosh. Yeah. It, it can be just uh, oh, terrible, terrible cases. So um, really when you have an episode of laminitis, you have to act very quickly. And so I'm gonna get into well, a little I, bit of- yeah. Can I back you up just a little bit? Because yeah. I had a couple of good, first of all, that was amazing. It really, it, it's the first time I really understood what's going on, but we did have a couple of questions. Um, 
And Addis says she loves the detail of the shading difference because you can really highlight, you know, you highlighted that well. Um, Sue asked if the dark area you highlighted is called the lamin, the laminar, laminar wedge. Is yes. That correct? Yep. Okay. And then Ada said that she has seen a complete soul collapse. Oh. And Sammy said she's had one fall off in her hand. Oh no. So yeah, this is and and so this is really underlying the importance of that. Um, I, and I love your analogy. So we're, we're thinking about fruit in a in a uh, in a jello, and if you if you melt the jello, the fruit falls. Yeah. And so the loss of this, um, and if, uh, I'm not really a great remember of all the the details, but this this particular substance, if it's gone, um, or things are moving, that's bad, is yes. what I'm hearing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so these cases are so very important to treat um, immediately. Call your veterinarian, get pain medication on board. I typically treat mine with um, banamine and acetaminophen. Um, so acetaminophen is Tylenol um, and that can, it's not an NSAID, so it can be given in conjunction with an NSAID. And I find these horses are so painful that they need all that extra help that they can get. Sometimes I will add in gabapentin, which is just another pain medication. Um, and sometimes some practitioners will use um, ace promazine, which is typically used as a sedative, um, but it also has vasodilation effects. So it can help um, vasodilate, so expand the blood vessels. And we want that because we want to improve blood flow to the foot. Um, the other thing I tell people to do, and this is probably the most important thing that if you can take any uh, message home about an acute laminitis treatment is icing the foot. And so people, you'll hear, hear people um, say that they iced it for 10, 15 minutes. Uh, these horses need ice 24 seven in those first um, 24 to 48 hours. And the reason being is that we have to take away that inflammation in the foot. And so the sooner you start icing, the sooner you're going to help decrease that inflammation that, and you're going to help prevent um, rotation and sinking. The other things that I tell people to consider is, is deep bedding and hoof boots. My favorites happen to be the soft ride um, only because they make specific um, support pads that go in the boot that provide support to the frog. And so uh, that's the area, the caudal hoof area that you're going to want to support, uh, which will help to also relieve pain because you don't have it right on that solar area where you have um, P3 pressing down. So um, I really like the soft ride boots. The other thing is diagnostically, you can do venograms, which is what that picture um, portrays, which is an injection of contrast into the veins. And that tells you um, how compromised your blood flow is to the foot, um, which is really what we're trying to counteract. Um, and so this is tough because a lot of practitioners in Canada or you get your like, um, practitioners that are older or don't have access to some of these things, um, you know, you can't always get these done. So it's typically something that's reserved for uh, teaching hospitals or specialty referral centers. But if you have access to somebody who can do a venogram and can hospitalize your horse, then this is definitely a good idea. Any questions about this page? Yeah, um, somebody asked if you knew, I did have a couple come up. Um, have you used something, I have, I'm just gonna have to spell it, J-I-O-U-G-U-L-A-N. Um, yes, uh, that, so that's a, a herb. Um, I actually use it for my own horse um, and I really like it. I've never used it in laminitic cases, but I, I do really appreciate its use um, for like its anti-inflammatory effects for horses with, um, breathing issues so that in conjunction with spirulina is a really good um the good combination of herbs to use in horses that maybe have some uh heaves um rao things like that um and i have heard that it can be helpful in these cases but i personally have not had a case where i've had anyone use it yeah and i had another question which was would i sock supreme hydrochloride 
be a potential effective vasodilator as well. And would you please explain the question? Yeah, so um, what we're talking about are vasodilators. And so uh, I'm sure it would be. However, my, my typical go-to is, is still ace promazine because it's typically very safe and the sedative effects are uh, not that great, but they also help to keep a horse quiet when they're uh, acutely painful like this. Um, and so the vasodilators are just those uh, drugs that are going to help um, dilate the blood vessels to encourage blood flow. And so what happens in cases of laminitis is when you get the disruption to the lamina and the sinking and rotation of P3 is it presses down and compromises blood flow. And so that's uh, the concern with the integrity of P3. So if you lose blood flow to that bone, uh, you, you're going to have chronic issues from this uh, laminitic episode. And um, what you're trying to do is prevent those chronic issues from happening. And so vasodilation is, is one of those um, things that, that you can add into your treatment regime to, to hopefully try and prevent um, that decreased blood flow. You know, as you told us that you could go on all day, I just want to give you the 15 minutes heads up. <laughs> oh, no. Um, okay, well, I will um, push through this. I will just take a brief minute to touch on chronic laminitis cases. Um, and so you can see that there's a moth-eaten appearance to P3 in this because of that disrupted blood flow. You can see the, the chronic change, the separation from um, the hoof wall in this picture over here, you have what we call a ski tip appearance. You do have to be careful with ski tip appearances. I have a question mark here because it's not always there. Um, just because of chronic laminitis, you can have that uh, because of um, toe first landing due to other issues. Um, so just the compression um, from that repeated toe first landing can cause changes to P3. Um, and I will go on to another case if I can. Really, um, um, she asked if the digital cushion on the x-ray, is that, is that with the texture? And then somebody asked us, what's your opinion on Adequan for joints in general? Uh, I'm a huge fan of Adequan and I also really like Cartrophin, which is what we could only get in Canada before Adequan. Um, and so Cartrophin is essentially the same thing. Uh, and I, I like them. It depends on the degree of lameness, but uh, my horse is on Cartrophin, so which would be the Canadian version of Adequan. And then the question was about the digital cushion on the yeah, expert. Yeah, the digital cushion would be in this area here. And so um, really your conformation of your hoof is going to affect that um, the most. Yeah, so it can be compromised, definitely. It can be squished back there um because of the changes in in your foot awesome well thank you for answering those yeah. great um so i'm going to quickly go through this case uh this is just another case that we had uh and it, why it's important to do all angles this horse presented for um a uh left i think it was left forelimb left hind limb lameness um that he presented for and in this view everything looks really good um, I'd be quite happy with that. However, in this view, he has a P1 fracture. And so you can see the lines extending up into the joint space and then extending down into um, the bone. And so you do other views to ensure there's no spiral fracture. That's why the views are important. And treatment for these cases are surgical with um, rest afterwards and appropriate pain medication. And then this is just another case of a uh, hind pastern of a friend's horse that I took these radiographs for. And so again, it's important to do both hind legs. And so this is her um, right hind leg, which um, is, is not too bad. And then this is her left hind leg. And so this is a really good example of um, ring bone and arthritis in um, the pastern joint. And so you can see here all that um, sclerotic bone and the bony remodeling over here, the osteophytes that we have. So those little pinpoint um, pricks of bone that are coming up into the joint space. And uh, then you can see the collapse of the joint space here. So um, that is uh, 
DJD and arthritis and um, fusion of a joint. And so again, here we get into some of our treatment options. Uh, you can chemically um, fuse those joints with alcohol or you can go to surgery and put a plate in and that's a little bit faster, but you have the associated surgical risks with those. You can also manage with uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like bute, equiox, or prevacox, uh, joint injections, or um, adequin or cartrophin. This is just um, another example of a subchondral bone cyst. So this is P1, and this is the cyst in here. And so that's just kind of a, a neat image. Some of the next images are pretty cool. And so we'll just go through these. Um, this is an old fracture in this horse who had uh, obviously P1 was destroyed, um, but you can see the bony remodeling that this horse is doing desperately to try and um, heal and stabilize this, this bone and, and these joints. Um, so you can see that the, the bone is, is coming up from the bottom here on P2 to try and stabilize P1 and P1 is trying to heal. So that's just kind of a, a gnarly case. And then we have the knee. Uh, we have this beautiful example of the most perfect horse in the world, uh, Countess Victoria, that's my horse. And, and I took this radiograph, so I am pretty proud of it. It's a, it's a, it's a really nice picture and it's just a normal um, carpal radiograph. And then some of the common things that we see with the carpus, so the knee, are slab fractures. Uh, and you can see that in this picture here. So we have to get this skyline view where we go from above and bend the knee to pop those um, carpal bones out so we can see if they're fractured. It's a little bit harder to see, obviously in this side view, you can't really appreciate that fracture as well, but you can see that it is there. And third carpal bone is definitely the most common fracture. Typically we see this in racehorses where they have that repeated concussion um, and hard work on their, their legs. And so the treatment for this is surgery, which is some cool pictures. And they put a screw in that one. So that was a, a really cool, cool case. Um, and then finally the tarsus. And so this is the hawk. Uh, we wanna have these bones here um, and the joint spaces in between. And so we wanna be able to say that they're, they're even on both sides, no collapse. We can see through those um, fairly well. And so these are really good images. And here we see, um, this is what happens to basically any horse um, and every horse. We see some arthritis forming and you can see how those joint spaces in the middle have disappeared. And so this is um, some uh, arthritis here of the hawk, uh, but this is uh, this is all fused on both back legs. So um, this horse again, some arthritis here, that little osteophyte, and some changes here where that those uh, joints have fused. But um, this is my own horse, and she's sound. I've knock on wood, not had an issue with her hawks. Um, but this is, so this is why you have to really take things with a grain of salt um, and evaluate your radiographs in conjunction with your clinical signs from your patient, uh, because these are, you know, this is some, some good changes to the hawk, but a great example of not uh, having an associated lameness with it. Uh, the most common uh, x-rays that we'll see with um, the tarsus are OCD lesions, and that's um, basically essentially where we have cartilage that doesn't form. So it's a similar concept to the subchondral bone cyst, and they create a little piece of bone that can get kicked off of the main bone. And so you can see the little piece of bone here, and in this view, here it is. <laughs> this is really hard for surgeons to find too, but it can... Uh, commonly be associated with lameness. And we find them in these young horses that just start to work. So um, our warm bloods, our standard breads, these young horses that grow really, really fast uh, can have these defects. So it's really common. There is a genetic component. There's also some studies that show that feeding your mares really, really high fat um, sugar foods can create these in their, um, in their foals. And so you just have to take these into consideration, especially these young warm bloods that we're feeding all this grain to or young standard breads that they're just pounding the sweet feed to these horses. Um, they are at risk of developing these OCD lesions. 
um, much more easily than other horses. And so the, sur the treatment for this is surgery and that's that same horse. And you can see they went in here, this is a gas pocket under the skin where they removed that little bone uh, fragment. And this is the coolest case that I've seen to date. My friend took these radiographs. Um, the horse is not lame. It's a young seven-year-old paint horse gelding that um, has not had any associated lameness. He walks fine, he trots fine, and he canters fine. However, he does have a weird looking tarsus um, on both hind legs and they just looked very uh, chunky and bony and they wanted to take radi radiographs because they were curious of what they look like. And so this horse has no tarsal bones in between here. So it's really your metatarsal and then just like the top of the hawk joint right there. So it's missing all those two rows of tarsal bones in between there. So uh, in both hind legs, which is um, crazy. And it's not lame because again, horses are strange creatures. Well, there's your proof right there, isn't it? Yes. Like, uh, look at that and say, how can that possibly be? Yeah, yeah. They don't, re again, not reading the textbook. Yeah, the, book, the horse didn't read the textbook. Yeah, yeah I, I do get a, I got a couple questions. One, Emily asked if what your stance is on PEMF treatments to encourage bone healing, remodeling, and inflammation reduction and increase circulation. Um, I think they're great um, to an extent, obviously, as additional therapy to what you're already doing with your veterinarian, because um, the, the effects aren't going to be as long lasting um, or as effective for long term as some of your other treatment modalities. Um, so certainly, it's, I think that, that it's great. Um, but the, the downfall is, is these, some of these treatments should be done very consistently and, and it's not always feasible for everybody. So, you know, the benefits are, are short term, I think, in some of these, these treatment modalities. And then I got another one. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Emily, thank you for that. She said the perfect answer. And then um, Heidi Martin pointed out that her uh, thoroughbred had a fracture, but did not have surgery and he's eventing now with no issues. So once again, her horse did not read the textbook, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. And sometimes they do. Sometimes it depends on the fracture too and where it is. So yeah, that's awesome. Well, it's great. So um, does it, I want to tell you, uh, oh, somebody asked here, Susan asked, uh, what can you feed to help slow down possible arthritis development? Ooh, um, I don't know if there's anything you can feed per se. Um, but for my arthritic horses, I always tell people to keep them moving, keep those joints um, working. And you can provide things like um, cartrophin um, or some of those other additional like Equiox, Prevacox. And I, I do tell people um, to try and stay away from things that are too high in sugar. I think with anything, even it's the same as people. Um, a lot of sugar is not always good for the body. And um, I just think that some of these horses may have underlying issues. I don't know if it will necessarily speed up any arthritic changes, but certainly some other um, issues can be like laminitis or founder if you have any horses that are very sensitive to sugars. Um, so I just tell people to feed feed appropriately and consider high fats and high proteins as opposed to um, sugars and starches. Well, I certainly appreciate that. Thank you to everybody who's donated. We do rely on donations to keep the IHA going as well as our membership. Um, one of the members wrote, thank you so much for your explanations on these common lameness issues. It's great to have in-depth information on the anatomy of our horses and information on diagnosis and treatment. Very interesting presentation. Now, somebody asked, I want to ask if the best way short of regular trims is good is a good best practice for pigeon toed Appaloosa. Yeah, I think your best friend in that area is your farrier and um, whoever is trimming your horse, whether that be you or someone else, I think keeping on the trimming is going to be so, so beneficial in helping to just prevent any lameness issues down the road. Okay, I had a question about, should we give glucosamine and chondroitin? 
Yeah, I think um, if you're going to give glucosamine and chondroitin, you should probably find something that also has hyaluronic acid in it. Uh, they work really well together and almost synergistically. So uh, they will benefit each other. Um, the hard part about these medications is oral bioavailability, meaning how well the horse absorbs these is um, not great. So, uh, you know, you, you might, if you're not d dealing with a really high quality product, you may be putting more money down the drain than what your horse is, is benefiting from. Um, so I tell people to try to stick to um, things like flax or flax oil, which are high in um, uh, like the omega-3, 6, and 9 ratio is really good in that product. And, and it's really good at um, anti-inflammatory effects. So I try and tell people to stick with products like that, that just seem to be um, maybe a little bit more bang for your buck and beneficial to your horse. Thank you very much. People asking, or just not lots of people saying, thank you so much. It's very educational. I do have a question. Somebody asked if you've diagnosed many cases of C6, C7 malformation on these mystery lameness cases. Um, that's a tough one because ideally, um, you know, your radiographs don't always show changes in that area that you can really appreciate. Just you have to be so um, particular about your, your spinal um, radiographs. Um, and so CT is probably your best bet for diagnosing those. And not everybody is going to go ahead with a CT scan because it requires general anesthesia and um, they have to be under. So it's, I haven't, um, because it's, it's a tough one to diagnose. Um, but I've seen a few, I've seen enough and I've seen some terrible cases, um, w associated with that, but there's, thankfully I haven't seen too, too many. Thank you so much tonight. Um, the radiographs, I'm getting comments across America about how awesome your great radiographs were shown tonight. I learned a great deal myself. People are asking us for part two. <laughs> so we're going to schedule you back. Okay. And, uh, you know, it's been delightful. I, I, you, you warned me that you were visual and I was delighted to hear it. And I'm actually ecstatic on what I've learned tonight. So a lot of people are seconding for part two. We want to invite you back. Perfect. And these classes are incredibly important. Um, we so appreciate your time tonight. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I'm really glad that um, I could do this for everyone. Well, I love it. And we continue the report on the revolution in horsemanship and what it means to mankind and your contribution as a veterinarian. And you're obviously an educator helping us understand how to you know, work with our veterinarians and, and give our horses a better deal. We so appreciate what you do. And so I want to thank you on behalf of everybody on the call across America. Oh, thank you so much. I, I had a lot of fun. And like I said, I could talk forever. So I'm glad we're doing part two. I love it. Thank you to all, all of the IHA leaders and members who support what we're doing. Uh, thank you to all of our guests across America who are with us today. And most importantly, thank you, Danielle Thibault. Yes, wonderful. And may the horse be with you. Good night, everyone. Two hearts beating, four feet flying.